G'day everyone, welcome to the latest edition of Gov's uh, Video Hero Review Series. Uh, in this episode, we are going to be taking a deep dive into the January 2022 Hero of the Month, who is Sir Casimir. So, welcome to all of my returning viewers and a special welcome to those of you if this is your first time uh, joining us for one of these reviews. I hope the content of this video, as always, is clear and helpful to you and your ally mates in your puzzle combat journeys. So, in that vein, feel free to leave me a like and slash or a comment if you're finding it all to be good, useful and whatever. And if you're feeling extra special as a person, you can even hit that little subscribe button if you've not already done so. So, as always, uh, please do not hesitate to share the video around with your ally mates. It is made to be shared and to be shown and helping everyone as much as it can be. So. Yeah, if you think it will be beneficial to them, please do hit the sharing as well. So, enough of the self-promotion of the video and my channel, it's time to dive into Sir Casimir. So, by way of a quick overview, Sir Casimir is a purple legendary hero released in the uh, month of January in 2022. He's the first hero of the month of the new year, so that's got going for him. Uh, he has the title of being a Knight Errant. Uh, and is a proud member of the Warfighter class. Um, yeah, so if we pull up his full or complete z image, uh, so that's the zoomed in one, we can see that they are definitely picking up on a number of the knightly tropes. Uh, most obvious are the, um, the full set of medieval armor, as well as the giant uh, shield that he's touting there on his arm. Uh, the size of the shield is probably very restrictive for a horseback knight, however it is much more in line with the form of shield uh, used by the knights when they are on foot. Um, so that does tie in a bit, I guess, to the sword, if you want to call it that, that he's wielding, uh, the gun with the giant saber on the end of it. Um, so yeah, or bayonet, sorry, is probably the more accurate one. Uh, interestingly, with a knight errant, uh, they were sort of knights that were off in search of adventure, so they were questing for challenges and adventures that would test them in battle, um, allow them to display their skill as a knight, but also their, their chivalry and all that kind of thing as well. So, yeah, there's not really too much in that with regards to this image, but I guess it's just a nice little piece of trivia for you guys. Uh, final thing that I noticed, which I thought was a little bit interesting, was his choice of footwear. Um, not very knightly to wear a pair of, um, combat boots, but, you know, I guess neither is wielding a assault rifle, so, yeah. Um, anyway, flicking over from his, uh, zoomed image and pulling up his special skill animation, I'll just hit the play button and show us that one, so... There you have it. So we can see there what his skill looks like. It is interesting, they changed the shape of his shield, uh, the one in the animation has a very rounded top, whereas the one that he wields in his imagery is a very pointed on the top, so something a little bit different there, but the other thing that's kind of interesting is that I don't know how much a knight um, would be using his shield to shield allies, usually it was a personal uh, protective uh, device, um, not usually a pardon me, a member of things like a shield wall or the like, so yeah, just something a little bit odd in his animation, but that's alright. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much all we've got on the image and that kind of thing, so let's flip back over to his, um, his hero card and we can start going through that card in some more detail. So whizzing quickly through his base stats, we can see that he has an attack stat of 634, a defense stat of 728, and a HP stat of 1,470. Uh, so overall, these stats are extremely skewed towards uh, the defense and HP stuff. So the attack stat has suffered as a result of that. It is down in the bottom 20% of legendary heroes in the game. However, his defense stat is in the top 20%, and sorry, the top 15% for his defense stat, and his HP stat is in the top 20% as well. So you can very much see the, the shift and the gearing towards the defense and HP stats in that. Moving a bit further down, we can see that his charge speed is there, and it is listed as being 38, which puts it in the 12 tiles to charge uh, bracket of being a slow hero. If we can give him a plus 5 improvement to his speed, it does reduce the number of tiles down to 11, 
um, which is actually fairly easy to achieve. You can do that with a completely unleveled version of the Bull Pop, Bull Pop which is a five-star vanilla um, purple weapon. Unfortunately, however, at this point in the game, if you don't have that Bull Pop, then you've got no way of charge breaking Sir Kazmir because even if we pick up his speed node on the plus 19 emblem node, uh, you would still need a plus four on his speed. So being the only purple speed gun available at the moment, you kind of need the bull pop in order to charge break him. Moving on from speed and having a look at the class, as I mentioned earlier, Sir Casimir is a member of the Warfighter class, which very much fits in with him being a knight. Um, Warfighter class is actually one of the the really great ones in the game in that it's not really limited to any specific style of hero. Um, you can have a warfighter who is a healer or a warfighter who's an attacker, and it really doesn't make a difference because given the right situation, if the warfighter class talent triggers, which is when it does that, it basically brings them back or revives them on one HP when they take a death blow. So it's a very powerful... Um, class talent which can really mess up an entire battle or save one depending on the perspective um, so yeah it, I'm sure by now if you've been playing the game for a while you will have experienced one of those times when the warfighter class talent really just kicks in at the wrong time completely in terms of emblems and the priority of assigning emblems to him I would probably put Sir Casimir in sort of a second class um, or a second tier if you will um, the top tier heroes are probably ones like um, Vincent, Mortis, and Sato, possibly Jackie in that top um, bracket as well. Um, so Casimir I'd probably put into the second tier, which has heroes like Siegfried, Reaper, um, even Quake and Calamity, who are four-star heroes. I'd probably put them on a second tier below those top priority ones. If we were doing emblems on Sir Casimir, being a completely supporting um, hero in terms of his abilities, I would 100% recommend you prioritizing a defense and HP route um, for his emblems. Grabbing attack nodes isn't really going to help you anything. Um, so yeah, if we follow that defense and HP uh, path, we can see what it looks like there. Um, so doing that, we go left on the first branch, then right, then left, then right to grab a def uh, defense node. Then we go left, left, and that's pretty much it. So you can see there, I have very much left it at plus 18 uh, in terms of the talent grid. Uh, the reason for that is basically that because the plus 19 and the plus 20 uh, nodes on the Warfighter tree here, neither of those nodes are really going to help Sir Casimir, um, especially when you have a look at how expensive they are. So plus 19 node is worth 125 emblems and the plus 20 node is worth another 250 emblems. So all up, that's 375 emblems. For two nodes, that really aren't going to help Sir Casimir much at all. So the speed node on the left-hand side of the 19th branch is not, as I said before, it doesn't really help Sir Casimir at all. It might help a little bit in defense in terms of improving how fast he'll fire, but realistically, it's not going to make much of a difference at all. The crit node is probably a little bit helpful in attack. It does raise his base uh, crit chance by 2%. So, you know, that's 2% chance that you're going to do double damage on uh, normal damage. So, tiles, that is. So, yeah, either one of them, they're very minor effects on Sir Casimir, and neither of them are really worth the emblems. And that plus 20 node is even less worth it. It's 250 emblems for a couple of attack points, which on a support hero... Not worth it, not at all. So, yeah, I'd recommend leaving it at plus 18. So, if you do need to have a bit longer look at this class tree, I suggest hitting the pause button right now. Yeah, so doing that um, path, we do see that we pick up a lot of um, defense nodes. So, in fact, we pick up seven defense nodes, two attack nodes, and three HP nodes. Um, so, all of those nodes together, they give us a total improvement at plus 18 of plus 30 attack, plus 126 on the defense side of things, and plus 116 HP as well. So that will net them, or net Sir Casimir at plus 18, a total set of stats of 664 attack, 854 defense, and 1586 HP. So 
quite a substantial improvement to the defense and the HP nodes, particularly that defense improvement. That is absolutely phenomenal. So moving on from the base stats um, and stuff of Sir Casimir, we can start having a bit of a look into his special skills, seeing as that's the next thing down the list there. Um, so if we have a look on his card, we can see that his special skill is titled Nerves of Steel. Um, and what it will do is at uh, 38 charge speed, it will add 345 armor for all allies and will add an additional 240 armor for allies who have less than 40% HP remaining. All allies will also gain a plus 53% chance to perform a special, uh, sorry, a support attack against any enemy that uses an offensive special skill for the next three turns. So if we tap the little question mark there, we can see that support attacks are not affected by status effects. Um, so that means it's not affected by attack buffs or defense buffs or anything like that. The final thing that his special skill will do is that it cleanses all allies of uh, status ailments. Um, which is a very powerful effect as well. So overall, just looking at those three dot points, we can see that Kazmir is definitely not an attacking hero. He's very much more oriented towards the support role. Um, so yeah, let's uh, break that down, I guess. So if we look at that, there's three distinct aspects. So starting off with the armor side of things. Um, so in terms of the armor, he will provide armor for all of his allies, specifically 345 armor at a base rate, with a bonus 240 armor available to those who have less than 40% HP remaining. So overall, that's a total improvement or total armor output of up to 585 armor to each ally, provided that the HP requirement is met for that specific hero. Now, in the battle side of things, Armor isn't quite exactly the same as HP, but for all intents and purposes, it really is almost exactly the same. So it's effectively pseudo healing. Um, as a bonus for the armor side of things, you can actually stack or compound armor with direct healing. Um, so there is that really cool effect where you can run an armor generator and a healer in the same team and still get full use out of both of them. Breaking those numbers on the armor side of things down a little bit more, 345 armor at a base rate isn't fantastic um, when you compare it to other 5-star healers that are available. Um, it is better than 4-star healers, um, but not by a huge amount. Um, so that 345 armor, if we compare that to the average HP of all legendary 5-star heroes in the game, uh, it does come out at being about 25% pseudo healing on that average 5 star hero. This will increase up to 41% worth of armor generation um, if that bonus condition is met of having less than 40% HP at the time of casting. So yeah, as I mentioned just before, one of the biggest perks to armor is that it works completely independently of uh, a healing uh, effect. So. What it means, as I said, is if you run Sir Casimir in conjunction with a direct healer, say Jocosta or uh, the likes of Wyatt, you are able to gain an absolutely stupid amount of HP return just by firing the two of them back to back. Um, so those two quick examples with Jocosta, you gain 545 base healing, um, then you can gain up to an additional 585 armor on top of that for a net output of 1130 healing in a single turn. So that corresponds to being about an 80% heal rate on a 5-star hero. With Wyatt, it's not quite as good because he does have uh, less direct healing. It's only 315, but that does net up to 900 uh, healing back by using Wyatt and Sir Casimir in the same turn, which is still 64% healing. So it is quite phenomenal the amount of healing that you can gain, and it can easily swing um, the tide of a battle just like that. Um, the biggest downsides to armor is that, as I said, it's not quite exactly the same as healing, um, mainly because there's a couple special skills which deal bonus damage or additional damage against armor, specifically ones like uh, Lillian or Pantera, Wildcat or even Wolf. Um, they will all kick out a bonus amount of damage if the target has armor. There is also the slight thing with some of the weapons where there's two perks which actually will inflict more of an impact on armored enemies. Um, so you've got the uh, the bonus damage against armor, such as on the Regalizer Magnum or the Athos Assassin. 
Um, there's also the armor piercing perk, which is shown on the Wyvernid or the Relic Hunter Bargo, but neither one of those two um, things is really enough to break armor as an effect, um, but it is something just to keep in mind when you are using armor generating heroes in attack primarily. You can't really control it on defense. The other thing to really mention and point out with Sarcasmia is that massive caveat that's on his skill preventing um, the the complete amount of armor going on to an ally unless they have less than 40% health remaining. So it is an annoying effect um, because it does mean you have to think a little bit um, when you're going to fire Sarcasmia. Um, you've got a decision to make really every time. You have to decide whether you are going to fire him off immediately and gain that basic 345 armor um, or if you're going to wait a couple turns until you might become where the healing might be a bit more clutch um, and then you can wait until some heroes are less than that 40% threshold and then fire Casimir then. Um, it's just something really to bear in mind. It's a decision you're going to have to make. I would advise if you are using Casimir with another healer that you will always fire Sir Casimir first um, before the healer. And it sounds really obvious, but you would be surprised how many times people just mash the buttons and fire the skills in whatever order. So if you fire the healer first, you're more likely to get rid of that 40% um, HP margin. And then as a result, lose the bonus healing you could, or bonus armor, sorry, you could be getting from Sir Casimir. So just a couple of things to bear in mind with that side of the skill. Moving on from the armor, the second line of his special skill states that Sir Casimir will give all of his allies a buff, which in turn provides that specific hero with a plus 53% chance to perform a support attack uh, against an enemy when they use their special skill. So it is the enemy's version of the support attack um, in that it will, um, its, its trigger is linked to the enemy heroes firing their special skill um, so it's the same buff, in fact, that Sabotai, the four-star yellow mech hero, will give to his allies. It does differ from the other form of support attack effects that are in the game, such as the ones given by Lillian or Jacob, um, which will trigger when an ally fires their special skill. So there is that difference. So, um, so Kazmir's is based on the enemy firing the special skill. Um, so it's, yeah. The mechanic, though, between those two different forms of the quote-unquote support attack is exactly the same. In the event of a successful roll or a successful um, proccing of that event, a support attack will deal 100% damage to the enemy hero. So, essentially what that means is they execute a slash attack on the enemy. So, slash attacks are what the defensive heroes um, will do to you. Support attack is essentially exactly the same thing. So there's not too much more I can really say about support attacks, but um, you can comment below or on Discord if any of that is unclear. But basically, um, Kazmir's buff allows all of your allies to deal damage to the enemies whenever they use their special skills. So it's a nifty little effect and it can actually stack up to being a fair amount of damage. The final element of Kazmir's ability we can see there is that clearing of status elements from all allies. So really, really simple. Any dispellable elements like attack or defense or charge debuffs, inaccuracy, damage over time, all that kind of thing. As long as they don't have the phrasing of this effect cannot be dispelled, Kazmir is going to cleanse all of those from all of his allies. So yeah, that's pretty much it. That's what Sir Kazmir does. So Moving on from just Sir Casimir on his own, um, we will look at Sir Casimir in comparison to some other heroes in the game, or more specifically, I'm just going to use one, because there is a hero who is very, very similar to Sir Casimir, um, and so if you've got one that's so close, why not just use him? So that hero is specifically El Coyote. So El Coyote is very, very similar to Sir Casimir in terms of what they do. Coyote is a vanilla medic class hero, also purple, also legendary. Um, yeah, so they are basically very similar in what their skills are as well. So um, if we look at their um, their base stats there, we can see that so Kazmir does have a higher net um, set of stats. So we can see that reflected in the power of the two heroes, El Coyote coming in at 662 while Sir Casimir comes in at 686. Um, in terms of the build of their stats, 
Both of them have that um, very substantial skewing towards the defense and the HP stats. Um, the defense stats are actually almost the same. Same with their attack stats, where it does differ quite a bit, is on their HP stats, where um, Kazmir is picking up a bonus 100 HP. The charge speeds is another point of major difference between the two. So, Sir Kazmir is coming in at 38 slow, which is the 12 tiles to charge. Coyote, on the other hand, is coming in at speed 48, which is the 11 tiles to charge bracket of average. So, comparing that to Kazmir's 12, 12 tiles to charge, 12 v 11 is a little bit of a difference. It does blow out a bit more when we have a look at how we can equip speed guns to the two of them. So, so Kazmir with that plus nine bullpup is still only getting him down to 11 tiles to charge. There's no way to actually break him a second time and get him down to 10 tiles. El Coyote, on the other hand, if we give him that plus nine speed gun, it will immediately break him down to 10 tiles. But interestingly for Coyote, if he's got the speed node on the medic class tree, he can actually break a second time down to nine tiles, as long as you've got that plus nine speed gun equipped as well. So yeah, Coyote is able to get a double speed break, getting down to nine tiles, where Kazmir can only get a single, taking him to 11 tiles. So pressing beyond their base stats, the special skills, as I mentioned, they are very, very similar in terms of what they do. Um, so Coyote provides 500 HP for all allies, and it is an instant heal. Kazmir, on the other hand, will only provide 345 um, HP is armor, unless the ally has less than 40% HP, in which case they go up to a total of 585 HP as armor. So, Kazmir is technically capable of giving out more um, net pseudo healing, however, it does require that less than 40% HP caveat. Um, factoring in their speeds um, and the tiles required to charge, Coyote is kicking out 45.5 HP per tile. However, Kazmir's base amount is only 28.75, but with the bonus um, armor, it does jump up to 48.75 HP per tile. So, there is an improvement on Sir Kazmir, but it's not much of an improvement over um, El Coyote. The final major point of difference between the two heroes is in the second buff that they give to their allies. So, both of them create a buff for all their allies, but where it what they are, well, they're completely different, really. So, Coyote will give a plus 48% defense against uh, special skills to all of his allies. So, Kazmir, on the other hand, is giving a plus 53% chance to perform a support attack on their enemies. So, it's, it's clearly very, very different in terms of the abilities, but it's also very different in how they are geared. So, Coyote is definitely more defensively geared in that buff. Um, it's aimed at supporting his allies and keeping all of his allies alive for longer. Kazmir's, on the other hand, is much more aggressive. It's aimed at dealing out additional damage and bonus damage to all of the enemies who dare to fly their special skills at his allies. So, ultimately, which of the two is better? Well, if you're looking at just having a healer, then Coyote is probably going to be better. He's more reliable because he is always going to give you that 500 health every time you fire his special skill. So, Kazmir, on the other hand, is probably going to be the better option if you have the luxury of being able to pair Kazmir up with a second healer, um, such as Anastasia or Jocosta, Wyatt, or any of those. So, I in that situation, I would recommend Kazmir over Coyote, simply because um, armor and healing will compound with each other and give you an even bigger effect. However... The choice ultimately is going to depend very much on what your personal playstyle is. If you're an aggressive player, then Kazmir is probably going to slot in better. However, if you're from the viewpoint that your support heroes are there to support and they need to keep themselves and your allies alive, then Coyote is probably going to slot in better and be more preferential to you. So, realistically, which one is better? Well, I'm not sure that either of them really is better than the other. Both of them have very common situations where they can excel um, and in fact exceed the the other option so realistically if you've got both options i'd probably recommend just taking both of them to 4-80 and then experimenting them find out which one is better so i i think this is about the first time that i can say that the two heroes i'm comparing i would actually rank almost dead even um, and it coming very much down to how you personally play 
um, the game more than anything else. So, yeah, just a little bit of food for thought as to where Sarcasmia can fit into everything. So, we are now on to the final stretch of the review. So, we're going to quickly have a look at Sarcasmia and where he can be useful in the different aspects of gameplay. And then that is going to lead us straight into the grading section. So, if we have a look at the different aspects of the gameplay, we're going to start off with defense as usual. Um, on the defensive side of things, I would probably say Sarcasmia is useful, but limited. Um, the main reason for that is that armor on a defending hero is actually fairly easy to combat in attack because you do have the luxury of being able to choose what buffs you're going to be taking, what heroes, and also, more importantly, what weapons you can equip. Um, so, because of that, having an armor generating hero on a defense team can actually be a liability if you're able to use armor piercing or even bonus damage against armor weapons. Um, if you were going to use him on your defense team as the support hero, I'd probably be looking at putting him in on the wings um, or probably actually more the flanking side of things. I don't think he's going to be a tank um, by any stretch of the imagination, but if you can fit him in on the left-hand side of your defense as a flank or even as a wing, um, he's going to be able to do that um, armor generation and more importantly, a cleanse um, for your or for his allies. In the raiding attack side of things and your war attacks, this is very much where he's going to um, he's going to shine most. Um, support heroes are key to good attacks. Um, I can't say that enough. You to be really consistently good in attacking situations, you need a balance of both damage and supporting heroes to keep your damage dealers alive. So, so Kazmir, as I said, he's going to be a great support hero in attack teams. Um, particularly if you can pair him up with a secondary healer, like having an off-color like Wyatt or even Jargle or something like that, then you're going to be getting both direct heal and armor, both of which will compound with each other and give you even more um, healing in the end. So I very much think that Sir Kazmir is going to slot in nicely to a lot of players' raid teams, um, and he's going to fill a lot of players' um, gaps in that purple support um, side of things if they weren't lucky enough to have El Coyote already. On War Machines, uh, this is where it starts getting a little bit less glowing on the side of things. So, um, on War Machines, personally, I don't take a healer in my purple War Machine team, but I do know that a lot of players do in order to keep the rest of their heroes alive. So, for my personal side of things, I don't really rank Sir Kazmir as a War Machine he hero. Um, he's got a very low attack stat and he's not actually doing anything that's going to assist the team in dealing out more damage, specifically more tile damage to the War Machine. So I'd rank him fairly low on that side of things. However, I am very much aware that um, smaller players or players that are hitting larger War Machines than potentially what their roster is capable of doing consistently, they do value um, support heroes or healers in their War Machine attack team. So it could go either way, but for me, I'd... I personally, I wouldn't be using him on a war machine, but that's my personal style when it comes to attacking war machines. If we look at events, um, in terms of competing in events at a high level, I would not use Sir Kazmir, period. Um, armor doesn't help in the scoring, um, and this is getting a little bit more into event theory crafting at this stage, but... Part of the scoring involved in competing in events is the health side of things, and armor doesn't contribute towards that health score. Um, so if you're going to be including a support hero in your event team for competing, then you're going to be wanting someone that actually does direct healing, such as El Coyote in this instance. So I wouldn't really rank Sir Kazmir very highly there. Um, he will be helpful for simply completing the events, However, if you're wanting to go for that high level competition and start hitting some milestones, then Kazmir is not the guy you want to be using. You're going to want to use El Coyote in his place. So I'm not going to rank him very highly, I don't think, in the event side of things. In terms of your general PPE stuff, PVE stuff, sorry, um, we've got PPE stuck in my head. In terms of all the other aspects of PVE, um, so this is maps and quests and all that kind of thing. Um, he is going to be quite helpful, uh, particularly to, pardon me, to a lot of up-and-coming players, um, because 
Armor is a very good way of protecting your heroes and keeping them alive longer into those boss stages. Particularly if you've got armor and healing, you can essentially double the HP of all of your heroes with an armor generating one. So he is quite useful in PvE other stuff. Flipping over to the tournament side of things, um, I'm not even going to bother talking about bloody battles because bloody battles are tournaments where there is no healing and more specifically in this case, no armor. So it basically castrates Sir Casimir, so don't ever take Sir Casimir to a bloody battle fight. It's going to be pointless. Um, charged attack, however, he is going to be quite a lethal weapon in that sphere. Um, in charged attack, his slow special skill speed will get quite a substantial improvement. And it can actually become quite a bit of a pain if you've got a slow healer and a slow armor generator on the same team. Um, on a defensive team, that is. In attack, he's going to be phenomenal as a support hero because you're going to be able to just rapid fire charge him over and over and over again. And really jack your team's um, pseudo health all the way up to being doubled. Um, so on charged attack, both in attack and defense, he is quite a good hero for those um, effects. On the buff booster side of things, he does create a buff for all of his allies, so that does give him something. Um, it does make him improve all of his allies in terms of their attack stats from that um, that tournament effect. Um, the armor is still doing exactly the same thing in both attack and defense, and the cleanse is still kicking as well. So in buff boosters, he's slightly better or about the same as he is in normal raiding and war attack situations. And similarly on defense, um, he's pretty much about the same on the defense side of things, if not a little bit better. So taking all of that information into account, this here, or this next section that follows, is my personal view on Sir Casimir from a grading scheme um, using the A through F scale where C is average. So this here is Sir Casimir's report card. So having a charge speed of 40, of 38, sorry, um, having 12 tiles to charge, I am giving him a B grade for w war and raid attacks. As I said, I think he's quite good there. On war machines, I've given him a C. For me personally, he's not going to suit my teams very well, but I know other players, he will help them quite a lot. So I'm just giving him an average grade there. On the event side of things, I have dropped him down to a D plus simply because armor doesn't help with the event scoring. Um, he will help, as I said, with just completing the event, but not so much for competing in the events. In PvE, other stuff, I have given him a B-. Um, I think he's going to be quite helpful there. In buff booster, in attack, I've given him a B, and in charged attack, I've bumped him up to a B+, simply because of that massive speed increase that he gains. On the defense side of things, I am giving him a C+, generally speaking, in defense. Um, he can be helpful, but I think probably El Coyote is going to fit into the defense team better and more effectively than Sir Casimir will. I've given him a B- minus in the buff booster, so he's gained an improvement there. And I've given him another improvement again in the charged attack, jumping him up to a B grade on charged attack defense. So overall, plugging all of that into my algorithm, um, we come up with a net grade for Sir Casimir of getting a B- minus on defense and also a B- on offense as well. So once again, this is just my personal thoughts and preferences with regards to the grading. It's not gospel. All of these grades are going to change substantially for each individual based on their own roster and their own play style. So overall, I would say that Sir Kazmir is a pretty decent support hero. Um, he's useful both in offense and defense. If we're comparing him to El Coyote, um, I it really comes out to being a six of one, half a dozen of the other sort of arrangement where if you've got the privilege of depth and options, Casimir is probably going to be better if you compare him with another healer. However, Casimir is definitely much more aggressive, whereas Coyote is much more defensive. So six of one, half a dozen of the other. So congratulations. If you did get Sir Casimir, I really do hope you'll like him. I certainly plan to level him up at least as far as... Um, 4-80 where he will like pretty much all of my support heroes um, be quite useful um, in both the raid and um, war setting so let me know your thoughts though on Sir Casimir you can jump down into the comment comments section and let me know if you agree or disagree with my assessment 
or if there are some hero synergies and applications that I've missed or overlooked. So um, as an extra reminder, if you've not done so already, but I've liked or found the content of this video uh, useful and helpful so far, please do hit those like and subscribe buttons. Um, so yeah, with the conclusion of the Sir Casimir review, it does mean that it is time to move on to the weapon of the month review for January 2022, which is the Zircone MGL. Um, so the Zircone MGL is a five star blue weapon, which is titled the Crystal Variant of the Melgor, um, which is a four star red vanilla weapon, um, if memory serves me right. Um, the Zircone will boost its wielder's base stats by plus 235 attack and plus 226 uh, defense. So there is a slightly skewed approach there towards the attack stat, but it's not very substantial at all. The two perks provided by the Zircone are a plus 27% impro improvement to crit damage and a plus 12% improvement to accuracy. So Diving into these two perks a little bit more, we'll start off with the accuracy perk because accuracy is one of my favorite perks uh, on the weapon side of things for the simple reason that it directly counters an enemy hero's dodge perk. And um, we all know how annoying the dodge perk can really be on a defending hero. So, yeah. Unfortunately, though, at plus 12%, it is the lowest improvement of any accuracy weapon. Um, and that's by quite a ways as well. The next closest is plus 16%. The other thing to note with a plus 12% accuracy bonus is that it actually isn't high enough to counteract any of the five-star dodge weapons. Um, all of those are 14, 16, or 18%. So yeah, 12% is just not bigger than those numbers. So you will still have a chance for the enemies to be dodging, even though you've got the accuracy from the Zircone in play. It is, however, enough to counteract the four-star dodge weapons, um, but to be honest, that's a little bit sad that a five-star gun can, at best, only counteract a four-star weapon. So, yeah. Unfortunately for the Zircone as well, the second perk doesn't really make it any better. In fact, this is really where the wheels start falling off the wagon. Um, so if you watched my review last month of the December 2021 Weapon of the Month, uh, you'll remember that I've, I've outlined the, the distinction between crit chance and crit damage when it applies to weapon perks. So as a quick recap, crit chance is, increases how often you'll land a critical hit. Crit damage, on the other hand, influences how big the crit damage is. So we can see immediately that the Zircone does not affect the wielder's chance to inflict crit damage. In fact, instead, all it affects is how big the crit damage is going to be when it is successful. And that right there is the issue. So in puzzle combat, all of the heroes, all the tiles, all the damage, everything starts off with a base crit rate of zero, meaning that without a crit chance modifier like those given by a weapon perk, the talent grid, or a buff, no tile will crit. Like they won't deal crit damage, which means that the only way that the Zircone um, MGL's perk will actually kick in as if you provide a crit chance from somewhere else, specifically from the 2% crit node at plus 19, or if you pair the wielder up with a crit buff generating hero such as Serra, Ryoko, Lana, or Min. So initially when I was reading through all this and having a look at it all, I thought to myself, surely the developers wouldn't make such a limited application for a weapon perk. But I dug into it more and I tested it and all that, and I was hoping that it would be able to piggyback off another weapon's crit chance. So if you had a, another blue hero and they had like the Ice Breath Saw or something like that, you'd be able to have the Zircone making the Ice Breath's crit damage even better, and it'll be all happy and rainbows. But it's not. Um, without a secondary source of crit um, for that specific hero, the Zircone is just not going to do anything. Um, so overall, I, I, I unfortunately I just can't give the Zircone a raving review. It's it's an extremely limited weapon, both in terms of an accuracy buff that isn't sufficient to counteract any of the five star dodge weapons and also having a crit damage perk which can't do anything if you don't have a 2% speed node 
or have another hero that's come along specifically to create crit chances. Um, so yeah, if you're lucky enough to get the Zerko and MGL this month, I'd personally probably advise not maxing it out. I'd probably hold on to it and maybe use it as fodder for another blue five-star gun. There is the saying, though, with regards to it, that a bird in the bag is better than two in the bush. So, essentially, accuracy buff, even though it's not big enough to counteract any of the five-star weapons, it's still better than not having any. So, there is that also to bear in mind, but, yeah. With all that said and done, I think that's pretty much everything I have for this review video. Um, as always, I am keen to hear your thoughts both on Sarcasmia and the Zircon MGL. So please do jump down into the comment section of this video or you can jump into my Discord server. Um, join the conversation there, leave us a note, have a chat, whatever you want to do. Um, once again, if you found this video to be good, helpful, useful, whatever, um, please do use those like and subscribe buttons. They do help me out. But Really, I think that's all I've got for now. So until the next video, um, make sure you all stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, happy gaming. Bye.